Hi everyone, I'm really excited today to explain to you our human pilot study that we published in 2021. This study uses a spatially resolved transcriptomic data generated with the VZIM technology by 10X Genomics. Please note that some of the members from 10X Genomics were our co-authors in this study. And so it's been a few years since then, but I just want to explain it again because um, I had never took the opportunity to explain it in more simpler terms. So imagine you're looking at two fruits. Imagine a banana, you have a banana and an orange, and you're trying to explain it to someone, what, is, what are the differences between them? You can say like, okay, maybe both of them are fruits, um, and one of them looks orange, and the other one could look yellow, they have different shapes, smells, tastes, and you can go on and on uh, mentioning uh, all the differences that you can see between them. But there's only so much you can see from outside, so eventually you might decide to cut them open slice them. And now you can see even more differences than before, right? And so by doing this, you're actually zooming in into the, into the tissue and noticing um, smaller and smaller differences. You can basically repeat this process with uh, other tools like a magnifying glass, a microscope, and zoom in even further. This is relevant for us because um, in 2020, the spatially resolved transcriptomics was crowned the method of the year. This is a technology that allows us basically to measure uh, gene activity levels on a slice of tissue. So you take a slice, an X and one plane, right? Like a sheet of paper. And now we can imagine actually building on top of it uh, bars. Um, these bars tell us the gene activity uh, levels for a particular gene. So imagine that this fancy 3D bar plot is telling us how much was gene one active on this square over here, and these other square, etc. Visium is a technology that instead of squares uses circles called spots, uses about 5,000 of them, and they're arranged in a honeycomb pattern. Um, there's videos by Turner Genomics that explain that in more detail, but basically we can uh, observe around 2,000 genes across all of these 5,000 spots. So it's like having 2,000 of these 3D bar plots that we can work with. That's a lot of exciting data and it's fun to, to jump into it. Okay, so now that we know what VISM is, let's dive into it and actually use it for some of our research. So um, just like we were talking about bananas and oranges before, um, something we want to understand is the differences between individuals that have um, had, for example, schizophrenia, a particular disorder, and individuals that didn't. Um, and so um, in order to be able to understand the differences between those two groups, we first need to understand the differences among uh, different donors that do not have schizophrenia. Um, so in this example, we can see like different bananas, all of them are healthy, uh, which is, uh, but they all look very different. So we wanna understand the differences of them, uh, between them first. We want to understand these differences first um, among what we call neurotypical control donors um, before we jump into, into other types of donors. So here in this study, in this human pilot study, we generated data from three uh, donors, um, just to have an idea at uh, biological variability. And so uh, we had three subjects and for each of them, we generated what we call spatially adjacent replicates. For every donor, we generated two pairs uh, one that is at the very beginning of the tissue sample, and another one that is 300 microns away from that first pair. These two pairs, you can imagine them as having a loaf of bread, where you take the first two slices that they're 10 microns apart. You, you expect them to be really, really similar, although there could be some tiny differences. And then 300 microns away, you take another pair that are also 10 microns apart from each other, and you also expect that second pair to be uh, very similar to itself and across the two pairs to have more differences, but still be somewhat similar. So that's what we wanted to see. We work with the data from a brain region called the DLPFC. And in this particular brain region, there are two known genes that, for example, SNAP25 is highly active um, in neurons and LWP is highly inactive in neurons. And so it's kind of cool to see for us that once you look at activity levels of these two genes, you basically get a yin and yang pattern, right? So they complement each other. 
And it was great to be able to see that again with this new technology. But we could also look at other marker genes, for example, PCP4, which is a marker gene for layer five. Uh, that's a very particular part of the DLPFC. And if you look at every row here, um, every two pairs of columns, the pattern is very similar across the pairs. Um, so that's nice to see over here and here, here and there. Um, and so this gave us confidence that the technology was working and that we could use it to do our research. So now that we were ready to do our research, we needed basically ways of visualizing all of these data. It's quite challenging. And um, to actually work with it, we developed a software that we call a special LIBD. This software, besides visualization, um, allows us to actually annotate, or that's basically label, every single one of these spots. We had over 47,000 spots across all of our 12 tissue samples. So that's around nearly 4,000 spots per tissue slice. That's quite a bit of work to label each of them and to assign them to seven different groups. Um, layers one through six, as well as white matter. Uh, our colleagues did all of this excellent work. And now that we have all of, done all of that work, we can now summarize and the data. And for example, do a principal component analysis. Principal component, the math of it is quite complicated and fancy, but the interpretation of it is quite simple. Principal component one, shown here on the x-axis, is the one that explains the most amount of changes or variance that we see. And we can see on the left side, all the black spots, which are the WM spots or white matter spots, separated from all the colored spots. Then on the Y axis, if we start at the bottom of it, we see the pinpoints, blue, green, purple, yellow, and orange. Those are actually layer one, two, three, four, five, and six, which was really nice to see the sequential pattern. And so all of this was known already that white matter is very different from the six gray matter layers. Um, and then also that the layers have a sequential pattern. That's awesome that we can basically reproduce all of this um, work from other researchers using this new technology. That gave us confidence that we can move forward with it. Is that all? Of course not. We did all this work using previous information to label all of these spots, but there's a lot more that we can extract now. So we looked at the data and found a marker genes to label each of these uh, seven different groups. Um, a marker gene basically here is a gene that has higher expression on the um, cluster that they're labeling or the region that they're labeling, and uh, but doesn't necessarily have to have no expression or no activity on the other ones. It just means that it has higher levels there. And that's um, here are four new ones that we found. And we also did some extra experimental work using other technologies to actually validate these results. These are technologies that can take a lot of effort to, to um, generate the data for, and um, it's not feasible to generate this type of data for thousands of genes. However, you can generate it for a few, and this is how you can validate the, the results that we uh, generated with Visium. So now that we have more marker genes for all of these layers, we can um, ask other questions. But let's say you actually want to find on and off marker genes. Well, nowadays we have a, a different software called the Coma Buddies that you can use to find what we call mean ratio marker genes that have this more on versus off pattern. But that's beyond this, this work. Cool, so now that you have all these marker genes, well, one of the things we can do, we can't really like compare neurotypical control controls against um, individuals that have uh, different disorders with just these three donors. But what we can do is ask, are the layer marker genes that we found, um, do they overlap significantly with genes that have been associated with other disorders? So let's say, for example, ASD, um, also known as autism spectrum disorder. In that disorder, there's been a few different studies. So for example, there's the Safari and the ASC 102 study. Um, they're independent studies, and they see they have their sets of um, AZ associated genes. And we can see that they match over here, where like they're significantly overlapping our layer two and our layer five marker genes. So that's nice to see that consistency across the two studies. But then, in particular, this ASC 102 one, you can divide it into 53 and 49. 
And what you can see now is that the 53 is the one that is actually associated more strongly with layer five, and the 49 is the one that is more strongly associated with layer two. So that's um, a very nice way of being able to not only localize the layer two and five, these uh, genes uh, implicated in or associated with autism spectrum disorder, uh, but also be able to subdivide them to more specific locations. Um, and so even though we only generated a small pilot study with three donors, you can now think of applying this for two other, two other studies um, um, in other uh, different diseases, different disorders, basically any other biologically relevant question or group that you have an interest in. It. This isn't our first time witnessing the emergence of a new technology. And we know that whenever a new technology comes into play, uh, there's going to be some issues with it, some imperfections, biases, measurement, noise issues, et cetera. At the same time, we were like pretty convinced that this technology was going to be a game changer and we wanted to use it again ourselves for other studies. However, like one challenge we wanted to avoid was this whole process of manually annotating thousands of spots. So if you don't want, if you want to avoid that, you need computational methods um, and you want to be able to group the spots in, into sets of similar spots. This process is known as um, clustering or spot level clustering in this way. What we set out to do was let's compare different clustering methods. And all of them are going to ge generate nice, pretty pictures, like the ones we see here on the left. Sometimes the pictures are um, clear enough for you to visually just say, like, OK, this one doesn't look as good, for example, this one on the bottom. But then between two of them that are like fairly decent, it can become a lot harder to tell them apart visually which one is better than the other. And so using this uh, manual annotation that we have, we can actually compare clustering results against that using a metric called adjusted rand index, where higher values are better. Um, so that's what we did here. And so there's a three different key things that we um, provide in this study. We made the data public as soon as we preprinted our study in 2020. We also shared the data in ways that it was easy to access it. Um, and then we showed how you can use your clustering results to compare them against the manual annotation. And so very soon after, for example, in September 5th, 2020, other groups of researchers started to use our data to test their methods. For example, here, base space. Um, and so they base space over here using just a random index and they show that overall their method is uh, Pro, uh, produces much higher values of adjusted random index than other methods over here. As an next spectator, really, at this point, we can be like, oh, actually, base space looks pretty good. Um, maybe we should use it ourselves. By actually uh, sharing data early, we were able to act, help accelerate science, at, but then also reap the benefits from, from this whole process. So what followed? Well, they we were able to um, publish a peer review study using data from 10 donors across uh, the anterior posterior axis, a total of 30 visium tissue slices. This uh, new project is the one we call Spatial DLPFC, and I'll explain it in a, in a follow up blog post. In the meantime, you can read uh, uh, Louise's um, excellent uh, blog post over here. And so at this point, if you ever see one of these figures or something that looks like it, now you know that uh, the data comes from the human pilot study that we generated, and you understand now why. Um, this data set is still relevant nowadays for the development of computational methods, but also for uh, further um, understanding uh, patterns of expression in a spatial manner in the DLPFC. If you prefer to, here's another video that showcases uh, basically a journal club style um, of the results of this paper. And if you want to, please feel free to browse our code at Liberty Institute slash human pilot hosted on github.com. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed this work. Thank you.